My name is Guy Daniels, and I am the microbiome expert. Welcome to another informative presentation on the microbiome. In this presentation, we will cover why your money, time, and effort can be better spent on a different approach instead of on probiotics. Probiotics are a multi-billion dollar industry, and many people are emotionally wed to probiotics, whether they be patients, doctors, or especially firms trying to sell you the unique strains. They are now even being sold in drinks and food, and as far as I'm concerned, for the most part, it's a gimmick. Some of the topics I present in my various webinars, like this one, can be a little controversial because they upset some people's belief systems, in which I have first-hand experience. But don't shoot the messenger. See the data for yourself. I present you with a more intelligent approach, and after viewing this presentation, perhaps you'll agree. Let me begin by saying that probiotics do help some of the people some of the time. When I say probiotics, I'm referring to those that are in supplement form that probably have viable bacteria in sufficient quantity which stand a slight chance of making an impact on your gastrointestinal function. However, would you prefer the odds of being helped some of the time, or would you prefer a more intelligent approach that has been proven to help most of the people most of the time? In this presentation, I'll talk very little about the enormous benefits of prebiotics. For much more on that, I have many other presentations. Here, we'll stick to information and perspective about probiotics, of which you're likely unfamiliar. When it comes to probiotics, there are various types and sources. We're not going to get into probiotics available in foods like yogurt or kefir. We're also not going to cover some of the newer probiotics hit in the marketplace, like Acromansum and Cinephyla. That's a presentation unto itself. We're going to stick with those that consume the largest piece of the probiotics pie, and the ones of which you're most familiar, the genera Bifidobacterium and Lactobacillus. As you can see in this slide, Bifidobacterium contains these familiar species, among others. As for Lactobacillus, recently the species were reclassified into various similar sounding genera, but to keep things simple, we're going to refer to them all as Lactobacillus. You need to understand the difficulty in assessing probiotics given all the different species and strains and in different combinations. And each manufacturer is trying to prove the worth of their strains with many in-house trials, which could be subject to bias. So, when attempts are made to assess probiotics as a whole, which is difficult, often we get results like this. Here in June of 2020, 60 Minutes had an episode on probiotics, and it wasn't very flattering. You can look it up online and see for yourself what they had to say. See the link down below. In response to the episode, the International Probiotics Association released a statement about probiotics obviously feeling the need to tell their side of the story. Interestingly, as part of their response, they state, and quote, it is important to understand that the scientific community widely acknowledges that probiotics do not colonize. I'll bet this is news to you. If you don't know what this means, let me explain. The bacteria in probiotics are not like other normal bacteria. They can't arrive in your gut and survive and thrive on their own. In other words, the implication is that you can't stop taking them. Probiotics aren't cheap, and so even if they give you some benefit, the prospect of forking over the money every month is unappealing. In August, two months later, this comprehensive technical review came out, and once again, the probiotic world took a shot to the chin. Among many statements, they say that, quote, however, probiotics are a source of a significant cost with unclear benefit. How unclear? They focused on eight clinical uses, of which three prominent ones are highlighted on this slide. Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and irritable bowel syndrome. Among many other statements their authors made, here are a few in regards to each of the three conditions. Again, not flatter. Now let's put these commercial probiotics you've been buying into context. We're going to use the term abundance, or to say, their count in comparison to other bacteria who also comprise the microbiome. Here we see the top 50 most abundant species found from a group of healthy controls in two large databases. These taxa are fairly representative of what a healthy microbiome looks like, although they do vary between studies. In the top 50 most abundant species, there are zero species from neither Bifidobacterium nor Lactobacillus, but there are plenty of proven health-promoting species from various other genera marked in green arrows which occupy a lot more real estate than your commercial probiotics and provide several key benefits 
which include the all-important production of butyrate, which your commercial probiotics you've been using cannot do. The beneficial bacteria on this slide are not available as probiotics in the marketplace, but you can feed them the fuels they love. Using data from the same healthy controls, here we look at some of your commercially available species. The first number after the species is the percent of healthy controls with detectable levels of the bacteria. The second number is the median abundance. So let's take the very popular Lactobacillus acidophilus, for example. It was not even detectable or present in two thirds of the healthy subjects. And when it was, it occupied 0.06% of the microbiome. So clearly Lactobacillus acidophilus is not determining health for these subjects. And as you'll later see, the data for Lactobacillus is terrible. Bifidobacterium, on the other hand, is detectable far more often, has significantly higher abundances, and has a much better data profile, as you'll see soon. If we view their abundance from the genus level, we see that Bifidobacterium is the 18th most abundant genus in these healthy controls, while Lactobacillus is way down at 39. Which proven health promoting genera are more abundant? All those with green arrows. They are the genera determining health and all of those orange arrows point to genera which house opportunistic pathogens, all of which are more abundant than lactobacillus. And these bad actors are kept in check by those genera with green arrows. Let's put your probiotics into a different perspective. If we just consider the bacteria in the colon, which excludes other members of the microbiome, such as archaea and fungi, and we also discount other sections of the GI tract, we're still left with an estimated 40 trillion bacteria. Factoring in a probiotic with a CFU count of 1 billion and assuming they're all still viable and they all make it to the colon, then you're increasing the bacterial count by only 0.000025. What does that equate to? Well, the best-selling car in the United States is the Toyota Camry, which weighs around 3,300 pounds. If the Camry were the mean healthy control microbiome by weight, then the probiotic would be the portion of the car of the weight of a plastic pen. Whereas the superhero of our gut, Fecalibacterium prausnitzii, which is routinely detectable at 5% abundance in healthy controls, would be equivalent to 168 pounds of the weight of the Camry, which is about your average human. So why not help the proven health-promoting players of the microbiome thrive? They are the ones who truly determine the gut environment. The orange color indicates that the taxon was significantly higher in the subjects of the respective condition, a bad thing. On the top left is the genus Enterococcus, which houses known opportunistic pathogens, bad guys. To its right is the amazing health-promoting genus Roseburia, which is almost always significantly higher in healthy controls. Below it is the superhero of the gut, Fecalibacterium with the most consistent health-associated data of any taxon. On the bottom left, we have the genus Lactobacillus. You know, the stuff that's in your probiotics. As you can see, it looks much more like Enterococcus, a bad guy, than Fecalibacterium, a good guy. The data for this supposed probiotic is terrible. Why would you want to add more of this to a dysbiotic gut? Here, the only change is the substitution of Enterococcus on the top left with Bifidobacterium your other main probiotic. It looks significantly better than Lactobacillus did, but still not as good as Roseburia or Fecalibacterium. And remember, it occupies a lot less real estate than those two and does not produce butyrate. Here I have four more genera with the data points I've collected over the years. These four are known as problematic genera, known to house opportunistic pathogens, like E. coli, which is a name you'll recognize which is within a Cherishia on the top left. The profile of Lactobacillus looks like these known troublemakers. Now, the million dollar question is, is Lactobacillus actively pathogenic or does it simply thrive in a dysbiotic environment? And is it guilty by association? I would say it's more the latter. However, the data is so consistently bad, I don't rule out any possible nefarious activities, small or large. But the point is this, you absolutely should not be consuming Lactobacillus probiotics in the dysbiotic gut in preference to feeding the incredibly beneficial taxa which really drive change. Beneficial taxa have profiles which look like this. 
Almost always, these butyrate-producing, health-promoting taxa are significantly higher in healthy controls as compared to subjects from the disease cohort. This is among the many things you will see here and nowhere else. Nobody has done this work. This has been at the core of my job responsibilities for years as the Director of Medical Education for a microbiome firm. Another thing you're not seeing anywhere else is the information on this slide, which is from my webinar on Parkinson's disease and the microbiome. If you have Parkinson's, or perhaps you have a loved one who does, you should be aware of this information. You see, the microbiome possesses thousands of enzymes which have a myriad of activities. Some of them can play a large role in drug metabolism, as we see here with L-DOPA and COMT inhibitors. On the left side, Enterococcus faecalis and Facium, along with Lactobacillus brevis and other taxa, all have been shown to possess the enzyme aromatic amino acid decarboxylase, which converts the popular Parkinson's drug L-DOPA to dopamine, rendering it unavailable for the brain. From a number of other studies, we know that Lactobacillus, other taxa, and especially Bifidobacterium, are highly correlated with COMT inhibitor use, which is another Parkinson's drug. This can help explain why drug therapy outcome is so variable among patients and why administering broad-spectrum antibiotics has been shown to improve L-DOPA therapy. I recommend the avoidance of probiotics in Parkinson's patients. There are probably a lot of well-intentioned doctors recommending probiotics to their Parkinson's patients, but if they were better informed, they wouldn't. This is one of the most comprehensive and invasive studies I have ever seen. I'm only going to bring up a few of the many points I could highlight. I recommend you get this paper online and read it yourself. See the link below. So quickly, the researchers took 21 healthy subjects, gave them a substantial antibiotic regimen, and then measured in detail how their microbiomes recovered over 180 days in three arms, natural recovery, what they call spontaneous, by fecal microbiome transfer, or by probiotic supplementation. Fecal microbiome transfer was the clear winner, as it always is. Natural recovery was in second place, although three key health-promoting taxa never fully recovered, which is often seen after antibiotic use. And the use of probiotics in post-antibiotic recovery had the undesirable effects of significantly delaying microbiome recovery until the end of the study, and causing a bloom in enterococcus, which is a genus containing known opportunistic pathogens, whose ugly data points you saw earlier. I know many people recommend the use of probiotics during antibiotic use. This paper may be a reason to rethink that strategy. In the previous slide, I mentioned how three key health-promoting taxa were reduced by antibiotics, two of which you can see here, Roseburia intestinalis and Carpococcus. Why are they here? Well, this slide is the accumulation of thousands of hours of work determining the key players in the microbiome. Collected here are the great universal or almost universal health-promoting taxa of the gut, recently reclassified within the order Eubacteriales. The darker the green, the stronger the data as a health promoter. Out of a thousand or more species in your gut, this handful plays an enormous role in your health. We saw most of them earlier in the top 50 slides for the healthy controls. These health-promoting bacteria have been found to be consistently, significantly higher in healthy controls and consistently significantly lower in the unhealthy ones across all diseases I've analyzed. Other health-promoting genera not listed here include Bifidobacterium, Odoribacter, and Allostypes, which are in other phyla. And Allostypes shehii was also noted on the previous slide. These incredible bacteria listed here can occupy a lot of real estate and perform many health-promoting functions beyond the highly beneficial one of butyrate production. In order to increase their number, you have to feed them the fuel they love through precise prebiotic use. By doing so, you drastically improve your microbiome and by extension, your overall health. In review, you can read the points from the slide above. I like to think I provided you with new and impactful information. And perhaps you can now begin to address the needs of your microbiome the proper way. Watch my other webinars and with a fraction of the money I just saved you from buying more probiotics, you can find the webinar with your condition of concern and get a regimen that is specifically designed for that microbiome. 
while taking into account other more individual factors. I hope you learned a thing or two from this free presentation. It's a great example of what you'll see if you join my microbiome university. I have 50 in-depth presentations on deck highlighting every conceivable topic about the microbiome. I'll launch a new Microbiome University presentation each Monday morning, and each Thursday evening, I'll have a large free group webinar for those with questions about the presentation of the week. So join now.